everyone. I'm pleased to be joining you during Brain Health Awareness Month, an opportunity to highlight the importance of protecting and nurturing this most critical organ. My name is Melissa Russo, Senior Program Manager at Brain Canada and the moderator of today's conversation. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a discussion that's near and dear to my heart on women, brain health, and dementia. Before we get started, I'd like to share some key statistics with you that highlight the importance of this topic. By 2050, it is estimated that over 1.7 million people in Canada will have dementia, and that roughly 60% of them will be women. Research shows that in high-income countries, women experience dementia at a higher rate than men do. For instance, the number of women who will develop dementia in Canada is proje projected to exceed men by, almost two to, uh, by an almost two-to-one ratio by 2050. Because age is a risk factor for dementia, researchers previously believed that these differences in dementia rates were mainly due to women generally living longer. But science is now uncovering more to this brain health story that goes beyond how long a person lives. For example, we know that gender can impact risk factors for developing dementia, which can present itself in the form of less access to education or repeated stress related to sexism or discrimination for women and gender diverse individuals. How symptoms are expressed. Women, for instance, may show more depression as a symptom than men do. And care needs and caregiving, whereby dementia caregiving duties do typically fall on women more so than men. We also know that brain health research subjects have typically been men. So it's quite frankly unclear whether current therapies and treatments are as effective for women. And of course, we know that when it comes to trans women, there is even less research on brain health and dementia than there is for cis women. So these are some of the realities that we'll be delving into today. I think it's really important that I also state that while this conversation is focused on women, we recognize and acknowledge that, th that this conversation and topic goes beyond the gender binary and that there are special considerations for individuals across the spectrum of women, girls, men, boys, and gender diverse folks that address their specific and unique needs. This talk is presented by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada in partnership with Brain Canada. You can find out more about both of our organizations in the chat. Before I jump in to welcome our panelists, I just wanna highlight a couple of housekeeping items. So this session is being offered in both English and en français. So to select a language, please click on the interpretation button on your Zoom control panel and then choose your preferred language. You'll also notice that poll questions will occasionally pop up in your screen throughout the session. I think you guys have already um, possibly gotten one and your responses will help us truly understand if we're meeting your needs. So please do provide your feedback. You'll notice that this talk is being recorded and the purpose for that is so that we can make this talk available to you on the Alzheimer Society website and YouTube channel next week. Lastly, this is a conversation. The chat is open and being moderated for audience conversation and sharing. However, if you have a question for a panel, please do send them through the Q&A feature on your Zoom control panel. We'll do our very best to answer your questions today, but any that are not addressed within the hour will be responded to by email in the days to come. So if you'd like to have your answer, um, if you'd like to receive an answer to the question that wasn't able to be discussed today, please do uh, just provide your contact information alongside your question. I'd like to acknowledge that the offices of Brain Canada Foundation are located on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Ganyange Haga peoples, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. We honor and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and dedicate ourselves to moving forward in the spirit of partnership, collaboration and reconciliation. In our work, we focus on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action numbers 19 to 24 that pertain to improving health for Indigenous peoples and on number 57 that focuses on advancing our own learning on Indigenous issues. Our team is sharing a link to the calls to action in the chat right now and we encourage you to take a look at them. I'd also like to point out Brain Canada's own efforts and the critical conversations surrounding sex and gender brain research and equity, diversity, and inclusion in research. 
I invite you to consult Brain Canada's SGBA Plus and EDI action plan, which you will find linked in the chat now. So it really is my pleasure and honor to introduce the panelists who will be joining us for this exciting conversation, all of whom provide different and fascinating perspectives on today's topic. First, let me welcome Angelita Cox, who is the daughter of Sonia Elizabeth Cox, as well as a caregiver and an advocate. Her mother is currently living with early onset Alzheimer's, was diagnosed approximately six years ago, and currently resides in a nursing home. Angelita is her mother's main caregiver, as well as a mother of three, a wife, colleague, and business owner. She also volunteers with Alzheimer's Society of Canada, for example, as a member of the Black Community Working Group on the National Dementia Guidelines Project, as well as with other organizations to ensure that other folks or families who are on the Alzheimer's journey are equipped and supported in a way that best address their needs. Thank you for joining us today, Angelita. Next, I'd like to introduce Lynn Poslins, founder, president, and CEO of the Women's Brain Health Initiative. Since that initiative launched in Canada and the US in 2012, it's really made strides in raising awareness about the inequities in research of aging and women. The initiative focuses on funding this research and in creating compelling preventative health evidence-informed education programs so that there's a greater understanding by the public of the best ways to prolong their cognitive vitality. Also here today and who we are grateful to be hearing from is Dr. Shafina Premji, family physician and medical advisory board member of the Menopause Foundation of Canada. She's a foundation, uh, sorry, <laughs> she's the founder and director of Mahogany Medical, medical Clinic and the v Village Medical in Calgary. And I also just learned um, a couple minutes prior that uh, she's also the founder and director of a third clinic called uh, Milestone, if I'm not mistaken, in Calgary, um, where she offers prenatal care, women's health consultations, and a menopause clinic. She also frequently helps her patients support their brain health throughout perimenopause, menopause, and more. A big welcome to you, our panelists, and to all of our attendees. So let's dive into a couple of questions. The first one being, what do you think more people in Canada should know about women, brain health, and dementia? And Angelita, I'll pass it over to you um, to kick us off with starting this, this, start answering this question. So I believe to start off, the thing that I, I, I think Canada should understand is that as it relates to women, and I'm only speaking again from a caregiver perspective in that I have firsthand experience caring for my mom and thinking back on my own journey, I would like for everyone to understand how connected all elements of dementia are, especially as it relates to women. So to say that, you know, when we think of dementia, the image that we have is that a woman who has dementia, it's such a diverse picture. We have to factor in several elements. You know, ethnicity is a factor. We look at socioeconomic background. We look at age. You know, um, one of the things we have to consider also is a woman's overall health or lifestyle in terms of the influence that may have on her brain health and ultimately on how her dementia journey continues. I could think back to my own journey in regards to my mom in that she was 61 when she first got diagnosed. And I would have thought of her as being a healthy person, but looking back now, I can see that there were other underlying factors that ultimately played into her diagnosis and is now playing into her journey. So I think that for me, I would like everyone to consider dementia as a very uh, unique journey. No two persons or women on the dementia journey may have the same experience. And there are various factors that play into it. So whether it's her underlying health conditions, whether she has diabetes or she has hypertension or any other health factors that might weigh in, her socioeconomic positioning, whether she has access to early diagnosis and treatment if it is possible. So it, it is not just a one fit all you know, title that can be applied to every woman in terms of her health, her diagnosis, or her journey. It is a very dynamic um, concept in terms of dementia and women's health, but they're all interconnected. Um, I also would like people to understand that there's hope on the journey in terms of the actual diagnosis and the treatment and the lifestyle and the, that it's not a sentence. There are options available. We may be slow, we may be delayed, 
in applying it and getting to it, but definitely there's hope in the journey. Thank you so much for sharing that, Angelita. I love this message of hope that you've just shared with us right at the top of the meeting. Um, I think it really kind of sets the tone um, and is just really inspiring to, to think about this conversation in that light. Um, Dr. Premji, is there anything you'd like to add? So I come from the, the standpoint of a primary care physician, which means that I take care of patients from the time that they are born up until the time that they pass away. And my focus is on women's health. So I only see women in my practice. I see women at three most vulnerable stages of their life. The first being puberty, the second being pregnancy and postpartum, and the third being perimenopause and menopause. And these are three times in a woman's life where there are significant changes in hormonal levels that directly contribute to many of the symptoms um, and quality of life changes that occur for a woman. When it comes to the brain health, a lot of women who are entering into perimenopause have uh, coined the, literally my last patient yesterday said to me, people think I'm going crazy. Uh, perimenopause presents a time in a woman's life where her estrogen levels start to become very erratic. And that comes with a lot of um, mental health, sleep, mood, um, depressive and brain fog, cognitive changes as well. Now, one of the things I particularly see in my practice is for women who are in perimenopause, which is actually defined by the years prior to your final menstrual period. So to clarify, what does menopause mean? Menopause is defined when a woman has gone 12 months consecutively with no period. So the time prior to that is perimenopause. And for some women, these, uh, this time of their life can actually last for up to 10 years. So it's a long time for women to be suffering when they're trying to lead um, their homes, their families, and also they're often at the peak of their careers as well. So when it comes to the brain fog and the, the cognitive changes that occur in midlife for women in perimenopause and menopause, many of them are worried that if they're starting to notice uh, things like forgetfulness, not being able to remember things, people's names, they're wondering like, is this going to be a precursor for me to develop dementia? Now, every woman, if she is fortunate to live long enough, will go through menopause but not every woman will develop dementia. Only 20% of women will develop dementia. And so there needs to be a lot of education in our healthcare system uh, between patients and their healthcare provider to be able to understand when a woman needs to be concerned about dementia risk. Currently in Alberta and across the country really, uh, when you go see your family doctor, you're, you go in for a yearly physical after the age of 50. We do not have a rec recognized or recommended menopause care assessment plan or, or an assessment visit with your doctor. And I think if women were given the opportunity to meet with their doctor somewhere in their perimenopause transition to talk about some of these conditions and these concerns they have, it would also allow the family doctor or the health care provider to actually speak to um, the patient about some of the lifestyle changes that they can do to mitigate some of these concerns. As Angelita talked about, a lot of what happens in midlife can be mitigated by lifestyle change. So that would be my, my message uh, regarding this specific question. Thank you so much, Dr. Premji. Um, Lynn, can you uh, add anything to the discussion on what you think more people in Canada should know about women, brain health and dementia? Well, it was frightening for me to learn that almost 70% of Alzheimer's sufferers are women and that women suffer from depression, stress, anxiety, twice as much as men, but research has historically has focused on men. That didn't sit well with me, that type of research inequity. Uh, so I founded Women's Brain Health Initiative really to level that research playing field because um, if, if people were only studying uh, men and applying the research to women, as was the case with Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's is the biggest cause of dementia, then that was a concern to me as I was getting older and worried about whether I was going to remember who my grandchildren were. I wanted to make sure that somebody was studying my brain. So there's something called bikini medicine, which is anything the bikini covers they're going to look at by sex and gender. So for instance, menopause, pregnancy, um, uh, ovarian cancer, that obviously they're going to look at by sex. But again, it's expensive to study um, uh, it's expensive to do research. So the philosophy was focus on the male rat and apply it to the female rat so you could discount for the hormone cycle 
meaning that you could take away three times the number of rats if you study male and apply to female. Same way they recognize though that women's heart uh, failure was presenting somewhat differently. If they don't look at the brain differently uh, between men and women, then they're not gonna find answers that are right for women as much as men. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is we know now with diseases like Alzheimer's, it's really a midlife disease with symptoms that show, show up in old age. And you were talking earlier about you know what a dementia patient looks like. Very often the imagery is an old person in a wheelchair, but that is a very late stage person. Um, symptoms often occur 20 to 25 years after changes to the brain has already happened. And you talked about hope, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but it really means that the earlier you start looking at your lifestyle, and lifestyle is the biggest risk factor for diseases like Alzheimer's, the earlier in life you start protecting your brain health through proper healthy lifestyle choices, the stronger the protective effect will be when you're in your 70s and your 80s. Thanks so much for sharing that, Lynn. Um, I actually, I think I heard a saying uh, not too long ago that I think relates well to what all three of you shared is, and it's that once you've met one person with a brain condition, you've really only met one person with a, a brain condition. Um, so I think that just really highlights um, that we are all just on very unique and different paths. And there are so many different considerations that feed into that path and trajectory that need to be taken into consideration to have um, you know, our, our needs meaningfully met um, when it comes to, to care. Um, I have a, a follow-up question um, for you, Angelita. Um, just given that you have a lot of personal experience with lived expertise in this area, um, is there anything in particular you think people should know about what it's like to go through this in one's own family um, mm -hmm. or what your experience has caused you to wish for in terms of public awareness around this topic? Uh, there's, there are a bit actually. The first thing is in regards to the initial diagnosis. I think for us, the way in which my mom was diagnosed was surprising. I think before I had a preconceived idea of what dementia looked like, as you know, the doctor had said in regards to an older person with dementia, the symptoms of dementia was also different from my mom in that it presented not with the forgetfulness, but with the loss of direction, her inability to remember simple everyday tasks is how it presented. Um, her routine got thrown off. So the cognitive impairment was the first thing I noticed with my mom. And if I had known earlier what symptoms to look for, we would have been able to get her along the path of an earlier diagnosis so that we can make those lifestyle alterations and in, as a family work together to help her. So I think based on my experience, what I wish I knew was exactly what to look for. Then secondly, where to go once I had those symptoms. So understanding that, yes, we're gonna to go to our family doctor, we're gonna have that conversation, but then we need to take it to a geriatric specialist maybe and have that person get involved and then do further testing. And then also in terms of medication, what can we do at what stage? So I think for us along our journey, identifying what the symptoms were and knowing, okay, this is dementia, then knowing where to go with it and then knowing what to do with it once we had all those information in hand. I think also creating a plan was also uh, an issue for us as a family because we didn't have the resources. It was only when we reached out to the Alzheimer Society that we realized that there are paths that we could take. Understanding also that the remedy for our family or other families was not necessarily the same path for us. So being specific to what my mom needed was very important. We look for timelines. It was we one of the questions we kept on asking our doctor was, how long do we have? Or what is the next step? And underline understanding that there was no, it's as frustrating as it may have been for us, that there is no timeline when it comes to or for in our case, my mom's Alzheimer's. And um, having that dialogue and being prepared for the un predictable was not a thing that we had to accept as a family, knowing that at this point, my mom may present with certain things, but then a couple of days later, it may be something else or a couple of weeks later, maybe something else. And being acceptant of the idea that we're not going to get all the answers right away, but know that there is a source that we can go to for that kind of guidance. So I think if anyone is on this journey or starting this journey, 
I think the first thing that I would like to say to anyone is be open and be prepared for the unknown. You may never be ready for what comes. And there, when it comes to the things that present along the journey of caregiving or caring for someone with Alzheimer's, it is a very dynamic experience. It changes from moment to moment. Thank you so, so much for sharing that. I think it's a really um, important and valuable message to get out there. Um, I will be moving on to the second question, uh, just acknowledging that we only have an hour for this session. Um, I think that oh, we can all agree that we can spend hours and hours talking about this. Yes. Um, so I'll just move on to, to the next question, um, but there definitely will be time at the end to uh, address questions from the audience um, and just have a little bit more of a, of a conversation. Um, so the next question is, what in your experience or work lately has surprised you about women, brain health, and dementia? And Dr. Premji, I'll ask you to uh, provide us with your answer first, please. Oh, you're just on, on mute. Sorry, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, so when we talk about... Um, the various facts, because I come from the perspective of, of seeing women in perimenopause and menopause. And so brain uh, fog and cognitive changes is only one of several symptoms that patients present with. Um, and one thing that I think that I would love the audience to know is that there is actually a direct correlation between women's hot flushes and night sweats and the correlation of that symptom to um, many other menopausal symptoms. So if a woman is having hot flushes and she's also sweating at nighttime, that's going to affect her sleep. If she's not sleeping well, she's gonna wake up being more irritable and more moody. She's also not gonna be able to think very well. And so there's definitely a correlation between hot flushes, sleep disturbances, mood changes, and, and, and cognitive changes as well. Now, when we look at the studies and the data, when, it, when we're specifically talking about um, cognitive changes, it's specifically verbal memory that's the problem. So the forgetfulness of, of, of simple, simple uh, words, or I can't remember where I put something, where are my keys? That's what women are, are worried about. And that's what they are, they're thinking, is that going to lead to long-term risks in terms of dementia or Alzheimer's? But when we actually look at the studies in terms of executive functioning and long-term memory, those those um, those symptoms are not affected. And so I want to reassure women that even if they're having many of these symptoms in the perimenopause and menopause, if we treat many of their menopausal symptoms, their brain fog will also improve. It's generally a very transient condition and it does improve in the postmenopause. So that was something that I learned in the last couple of years. The uh, International Menopause Society every year um, has a theme on World Menopause Day. And World Menopause Day is October 18th of every single year. So in 2022, the topic was around brain fog. Dr. Pauline Mackey, a scientist, um, released a white paper specifically about women and brain fog in menopause. And she has a beautiful article on there specifically for healthcare providers, but there's also a five or six page PDF file that is free downloadable for women. So if a woman is coming to my office and is wondering, Am I at risk of dementia? Am I at risk for Alzheimer's? What does my brain fog mean to me? This is a very simple tool that women can access online to get some of this information because as family doctors, we really don't have the education and knowledge about how to care for women in midlife, which is why so many women are getting missed. Similar to what Angelita is saying, is that if you had known what the symptoms were, if your mom had been given that information um, from her family doctor when she was in her 40s, maybe some of these symptoms could have been mitigated and managed earlier. But as family doctors, we are not given education about how to support women in perimenopause and menopause. And this is because of a study that was done back in 2002, which really changed the trajectory of women's health in the last 20 years. And so women are not getting the support that they need to manage their midlife. I find that between after giving birth and pregnancy and postpartum to the age of 50, that third 10 to 15 year gap, women are not being seen by their family doctors. So any of these lifestyle changes that we need to be implementing earlier are not being done. And so the earlier we can get into our doctor and advocate for ourselves, the more we're gonna be able to manage many of the con concerns that we have that we can potentially mitigate into our future. 
Are we frozen? I think Alyssa might be frozen. Alyssa? I think so. Yes. So. <laughs> I think Melissa was. Maybe somebody else can continue. I sure. think what Dr. Paremi just said is an excellent point um, in regards to getting information out there early. I'm thinking to myself just quickly, not to jump in, if only I had known the connection between my mom's, and I, again, with all, without disrespect and, and violating her privacy, mm -hmm. Her um her history in terms of her pregnancies and her hot flash and her hormonal issues, which she had had, and understanding the correlation between them both and putting them together. I think if we had been armed with that information, we would have had so much more time to prepare for what was coming down the road inevitably, right? So I, I totally agree with that point. Thank you. I have to say that a lot of our reproductive risk factors, so a woman who's had high blood pressure in pregnancy, mm -hmm. gestational diabetes in pregnancy, mm -hmm. preterm delivery, small birth, a baby, or a history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, these yes. are very strong uh, risk factors for future cardiovascular risk. And we, as women, after mm -hmm. we give birth, and I keep going back to that because it's literally what I see in my practice every day. We're so focused on being a good mother that our health always gets just sort of pushed off to the side. It gets swept under the carpet. We've had diabetes in pregnancy and then nobody really follows up on it. Nobody does anything about it. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for long-term risk? Our high blood pressure in midlife, or, you know, that could have been attributed from things that happened to us way back when we were in our 20s, when we were having our children. So it's a direct correlation between our reproductive age and what's going to happen to us in perimenopause and beyond. Thanks so much, Dr. Premji, for your answer. I'm sorry that I dropped off there for a couple of seconds. Um, I hope that doesn't happen again, but I definitely appreciate your understanding. Um, and thank you to you, Angelita, for just stepping in and <laughs> continuing the conversation. Um, so I'll just pass it over now to Lynn um, to address this question about what has uh, surprised you lately in your experience or in the work that you do. I guess it's understanding that uh, even if you have a genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get it. But on the other side, if you don't have the risk gene, you can still get Alzheimer's disease. And again, that's the impact that lifestyle plays. And as I mentioned earlier, lifestyle is the biggest risk factor. So one of the things that uh, we like to do as an organization is share what the science is telling us in terms of managing our own health and those of our loved ones. So what we've learned is that there are six lifestyle factors that significantly impact your risk of developing dementia. But if you engage in healthy uh, choices against those habits, you dramatically reduce your risk. And even as a caregiver, as you, you were mentioning, if you don't look after your own health, you too can succumb to dementia. And also these lifestyle factors, which I'll mention briefly, um, even if you do have a diagnosis, this will slow the trajectory of the decline. So the first thing is uh, exercise, physical exercise. This increases the blood flow and oxygen flow to the brain and makes it more robust. So engaging in exercise is very important for your brain. Another one is mental stimulation. You have to exercise your brain like it's a muscle. Um, like it's a muscle. And the more you learn on higher levels of education are going to build some cognitive reserve. So if one area of your brain starts to decline, another can take over. So mental stimulation. Um, nutrition also can impact across the blood brain barrier. So the healthier your uh, eating choices, the stronger the protective effect will be. Sleep, as you had mentioned, also very important because it helps to um, consolidate memories and clear the toxins from your brain. And you need to get seven to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep at night. Of course, the younger you are, the more sleep that you need. Um, uh, social activity, particularly difficult for people during COVID, uh, but staying socially connected reduces the risk of depression and, and um, uh, isolation and uh, is important for your brain health to prevent dementia. And the, the final thing is, um, uh, is physical exercise, mental stimulation, uh, sleep, social activity, stress reduction. Stress prematurely ages all your cells, including your brain cells. So whatever you can do to manage your sleep is very important. So we like to share this type of information. Um, uh, and, and, and again, I had mentioned earlier, we have a number of free resources, thanks to partners like Brain Canada. 
Um, we have magazines available. All you have to do is go on the website and, and ask for one, which has, again, a lot of this information, um, easy to access and understand and uh, available um, free. If you send us your email uh, address, we're happy to send those to you. But we've also just created an app. And this app through uh, seed funding from uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada has, it's a habit tracker. It's called BrainFed Habit Tracker. It's available free on iOS and Android. And it has over a hundred habits with lots of tips to help you engage in these six healthy pillars of brain health. Um, and again, the more you do, the better. So even though, you know, having blueberries is good for your brain health, just saying, oh, I added it to my breakfast, think now, you know, one and done, that's not the case. It's engaging in lots of little habits that's going to give you the strongest protective effect. So I do encourage people to download the app because it is free. And what's interesting about the app as well is that if you care about the evidence, like why we say the rainbow of foods, for, for example, to maximize your antioxidants content, why that particular habit there's a whole explore section which has all the evidence behind it and from a research team at york university who looked at our app compared to others in the space ours was unique because we provide the evidence you don't just have to take our word for it the evidence is there uh, if you care to to find out about it so again brain fed habit tracker i do encourage you to use it and we were just um, uh, acknowledged by apple as a featured app in health and fitness which is like winning an Academy Award in, in the developer language because it, it, it talks to the integrity and the success of the app. So again, people should see what resources are available. Of course, the Alzheimer's Society has lots of great content as well, um, but there are other organizations as well that people should take advantage of, of what we are learning. I just want to add to resources as well, if you don't mind, Lynn. Um, Dr. Lisa Mosconi, she's a neuroscientist um, who is in New York City, but originally from Italy. And she's just released um, her third book called The Menopause Brain. Um, and I have not read it, but I did listen to her two and a half hour podcast. And she's brilliant. And um, the information that she provides is excellent, not only for healthcare professionals, but for the everyday woman and trying to understand the science behind the changes that go along with the hormonal changes that we have uh, um, in midlife. So another excellent resource for, for women to, to access. Uh, Dr. Lisa Mosconi is her name, and it's called okay. the menopause brain. And to build on what you were saying with Dr. Mackey, she's actually um, studied, you talked about language. Yes. And women, women actually can retain their verbal memory longer than men can. And so one of the things that, again, in terms of understanding the research between women and men, uh, what she was saying is, if women retain the verbal memory longer than men, they may not be getting diagnosed as soon as a man is. So, you know, one of the tests for Alzheimer's is you get a list of words, you know, you continue different activities and you go back and repeat that last list of words. Well, if women retain that memory longer than a man, it means by the time she's diagnosed, she's further down that slope towards Alzheimer's. So she may escalate faster than a man only because she's not being diagnosed in time or as early as a man. So um, Dr. Mackey has done some amazing research in the field of brain health and women's brain health specifically. And, and same thing with respect to heart health, right? Heart health equals brain health. Um, and so for women who um, don't really know what their cholesterol levels are, what their diabetes screening is, what their blood pressure is, like if we have this, the screening parameters in place ahead of time, and we know how to interpret those results, it'll help us to mitigate many of the long-term cardiovascular risk factors, which are directly correlated to brain health as well. Yes. Thanks so much, Lynn and Dr. Premji. I think it's really great that we're able to share um, all of these available, amazing kind of enriching resources that are out there um, with the folks that are attending today. And I think it does tie back to what you shared earlier, Angelita, about the importance of just knowing what's out there and where to look for the information. Um, so just to, to close off this question, Angelita, if you can share with us any, um, any things that have surprised you from your work or experiences. Well, again, it's just in terms of repeating what um, Dr. Pramji and Lynn have said is that it is surprising, just again, based on my own experience and reconsidering my mom's health, how everything is related, how everything is correlated and interconnected. Um, again, surprisingly for me is the research and how little is done specific towards women and Again, within the Black community, you know, even from my own lived experience and speaking to friends and individuals who I've met along the way, you can see the clear correlation with the women, especially the women, in terms of their health, their lifestyle, 
their brain health, and ultimately their diagnosis. It's absolutely clear. And I think for us within the Black community in that we have certain conditions that are a little bit more prevalent, you could see that this is why in, the, in our community, we also have a cultural factor where we don't talk about certain things. So because we don't talk about, you know, how you're feeling in terms of your mood, we don't talk about menopause because it's, it's considered to be a taboo subject to a certain extent. In us not talking about these things, we don't address them. In us not addressing them, then as Lynn has said, the diagnosis and ultimately the lifestyle, the, the, the uh, dementia onset becomes more extreme among uh, the women. And ultimately that impacts the community. Because by the time the mom or the daughter or the sister is diagnosed, it's going to impact the overall household, impact, impact the family. So the impact for us within the Black community, I find, is even more severe. I find what's surprising is going into the nursing homes and seeing a lot of Black women who've been diagnosed, they're a little bit, um, their dementia is a little bit worse. It's extreme in that they're further along, you know, um, in terms of their care it's a little bit more required for them so surprising for me just to sum it up is the overall diagnosis process the correlation of our overall health as women from as dr bramji has said you know from the time we become moms and i think even before that i myself as a mom with a daughter i have already started to think about dementia with my daughter believe it or not and i've taken the example from my mom and from my own experience and I'm using that to prepare my daughter to say, OK, what has happened with my mom? What has happened with me? And what can I do for my daughter and other women? So it's taken that lived experience and my own data. And she talked about the doctor who's drawn the correlation between menopause and brain health. And I'm thinking, OK, my mom went into menopause at 39. And how is that going to affect me? And how will that affect my daughter? So there are, there's a lot that I have discovered. And it's just from my own lived experience. And I'm. I think that we, sh us sharing this today opens dialogue for others. And I think that is a great start for us. Angelita, I have a lot to say about your mom with respect to her age and her ethnic and your ethnic background. So first of all, when mm. it comes to hot flushes, we know that black women suffer the most severe hot flushes and for the longest period of time. Mm -hmm. But even though I run a menopause clinic and I see patients from across Alberta, I've had two black women in my practice in the last six years. Mm -hmm. That One of those two women actually went into menopause early. Uh, and so let's just describe and define what that means. So for mm -hmm. women who um, go through menopause at the average age, it's between 45 and 55. Uh, for women who go into menopause early, that's defined as menopause between 40 and 45, and premature menopause is under the age of 40. We also call that premature ovarian insufficiency. Um, this woman went into premature menopause, so 38 or 39. Right. Luckily, somebody triggered her to triggered the thought to maybe have her refer to a menopause clinic, because the guidelines actually recommend that for women who are in premature or early menopause that they are offered hormone therapy, hormone replacement therapy uh, from the time of their diagnosis up until the average age, which is 50 to 51, for the mm -hmm. prevention of osteoporosis, early onset cardiovascular disease, premature mortality, and dementia. Mm -hmm. um, that patient who I'm telling about, talking to you about, is exactly like your mom. But she told me her mom went into menopause early. She's still alive. She never went on hormone therapy, and she's just doing fine. So she's refusing to start hormone therapy, mm. despite the, uh, the evidence that there's much benefit for that patient. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of cultural yes. contributions to all this. Yes. And I don't think that doctors are actually aware and patients are not aware that mm -hmm. if I go into menopause under 45, some women are like, oh, this is great. No more periods, no more pads, no more worrying about traveling. Like, it sounds like it's all happy and merry, but actually there's significant risk factors to that woman and that she needs to actually seek out a menopause specialist, whether it's a family doctor or gynecologist or endocrinologist in her community to mm -hmm. help her mitigate some of these risk factors. Hormone therapy is not for everybody, but mm -hmm. for this class of women, for this category of women, uh, if they don't have contraindications, hormone replacement therapy is absolutely recommended and in the Canadian menopause guidelines. Yeah. Just to jump in on, on some of this uh, discussion. Yeah. Uh, we do know from, from some research that 
uh, women before natural menopause who do have uh, their ovaries out, say they get ovarian cancer for whatever reason, mm -hmm. have a huge increased risk uh, for dementia. Like we're talking 200%. Uh, and again, you may need to have your ovaries out. That may be the right decision, but mm -hmm. understand what the long-term risks are so that you can shore up against uh, the cognitive issues that you are likely to encounter. Um, so, you know, you may need to do more on the exercise and the stress reduction and eating and, you know, what does keep your heart healthy, keeps your brain healthy. Um, you know, you want to reduce your risk as much as possible. Thank you all so much for this conversation. Um, just shifting gears a little bit, uh, moving on to our last question before the, the audience Q&A. Um, what do you think governments and other authorities need to do next about women, brain health, um, and dementia in Canada? Uh, and Lynn, I'll pass that over to you. Um, okay, that's a difficult one based on the previous conversation. But it, it is a shame that today we're still fighting for equity in research. Um, and, and I know that there has been progress and stated progress that, you know, uh, in order to get funded, a researcher has to consider a sex and gender, but it is not happening across the board. And even if they are now uh, including women in their trials, they're not disaggregating the information. So they may not be reporting on it. Like one of the things I just heard at the Women's Sex uh, and Gender Dementia Conference, which floored me, was that uh, one of the drugs for Alzheimer's that was recently approved in the U.S., it's still under investigation here, this lecanemab, it had modest uh, results. Um, in terms of getting rid of some of the plaques in the brain um, in early stages of Alzheimer's, but it was only effective on men, not women. So even though like, then, and you don't see that like publicized anywhere. Well, why, why wasn't it at all affected with women? This is why we have to make sure that research does look at women differently than men and consider sex and gender equally. So that's one of the things. And I think the other is around the stigma. There's still a lot of ageism, and stigma related to diseases like Alzheimer's and menopause too. Um, you know, women still have to hide in the bathroom when they're having that flash, uh, when they're in the corporate world, they can't, you know, just uh, have people accept it. And there's a lot of shame around that. And that is very sad for women. So I think getting around the stigma, and that does mean talking about it. more. There's been improvements, still not great, but there's improvements in terms of people talking about their mental health, but not some of these other issues that women are dealing with. So, uh, you know, I would encourage more conversation an open conversation. Thanks so much, Len. Um, I totally agree. Conversation, having these types of open discussions are really important and need to happen more often. Um, and I'm glad that we all can get together today to kind of provide a platform uh, to do to doing this. Um, Angelita, I'll direct the question next to you, please. So I, as Lynn said, I think one of the things I, I think needs to happen is more targeted research and programs specifically uh, based on demographics and uh, the needs of patients. I think um, doctors need to be provided with the right resources to be able to help their patients when they come to them. I think that organizations, uh, more funding is required or needed to go after specific communities. I feel for me that what would, that would have helped me significantly if I had that resource available in my case from the beginning. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking even further back to, as Lynn said, in this case, and I am sure my mom wouldn't mind me sharing this, my mom went into early menopause for a surgical reason due to the ovarian cysts. And that is what happened to her. When I found out that I had cysts, then I started to pay attention to it. And again, as Lynn said, and Dr. Kramji had said, I made the lifestyle changes for myself to determine or decide that there were certain things I was not going to do based on what had happened to my mom. And likewise, we've said it repeatedly, what's good for the body is good for the brain. The importance of having that open dialogue, we need to have those conversations and take away the taboos and the stigma and the cultural barriers that are impeding us from having the dialogues that will help us to be able to alter our lifestyles and affect the changes in women so that we can be able to bring these numbers down or even have individuals who are more predisposed to dementia be armed with the information they need so that they can be equipped to journey on the dementia journey. So I think there's a lot that we need to do still across the board. 
Thanks, Angelita. And I just want to say really quickly, um, I feel like a common theme in the conversation is just this notion around the control that we do have um, over our journeys through lifestyle factors. And I think that there's just a really important element of empowerment there um, that I that I just want to highlight for, for the group that's tuning in today. Um, so Dr. Premji, do you have anything to add just in terms of what you think governments and uh, other authorities should be doing next about this topic? So I'm sure across the country, there, there is a known uh, gap with respect to primary care and the uh, availability of a family doctor. And uh, I, I'm taking this from a different perspective because this is what we as physicians are, are trying to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. When it comes to compensation and the work that we do at free for service uh, um, in, in, in the clinics, we uh, basically have a billing code that we use so that when a patient comes into the office for whatever visit it is, whether it's for a growth check, a physical, a pap test, um, follow up on prescription medications, a pregnancy appointment, we have billing codes that we use. So in Alberta specifically, we have a billing code for a prenatal appointment. We have a billing code for a postpartum appointment. We have no billing code for a midlife menopausal mm -hmm. appointment. Uh, we have a billing code for growth checks for children. Why is it that women are not given the opportunity to have the conversation with their doctor about all of their health con concerns? So that is that to me is a big barrier because we as physicians are not given, there is no, um, it's not made to look like it's an important part of our conversation with women. If we had a billing code, there would be some impetus for that family doctor to actually try to help themselves, educate themselves about, okay, what do I talk to about with a woman who's in perimenopause? If I had a billing code that, that was approved by the government, whether it was uh, a, you know, a national billing code or specific to each province, it would give the impetus for the doctor to say, hey, you're 40, why don't you come in for an appointment? Let's talk about your perimenopause. And so if we had that kind of support, from the government with respect to a billing code for menopause care, midlife, women's health care. This is going to enable so much change, both on the pr prospect of the patient as well as the physician as well. So that would be where I'd be putting all my eggs. And um, as a menopause society, this is something that we're trying to urgently trying to do with our, with our advocacy, but I mean, we have a long ways to go, but that is one area of, of, of advocacy that we're really trying to focus on right now. Thanks so much, Dr. Premji. That certainly is uh, new information to me. So I just uh, really appreciate you sharing that um, and just making it known that this is a huge gap in our in our system. Um, so that just that concludes for now. Just the, the kind of the pre-planned questions that we had. Um, so thank you so much to all three of you for for this really interesting and much needed conversation. Um, so we're going to move on to the the question and answer period. Um, from, from our audience members. So I'll, I'll go ahead and choose a question from the Q&A box, but I just wanted to remind folks that if you ask a question um, that we aren't able to, to answer live, uh, also again, we have just only a couple of minutes, so it'll be a quick Q&A period. Um, the Dementia Talks uh, Canada team will follow up via email in the days to come, um, just provided that you uh, include your name and your contact information with your question. So I will pull up the questions here. And the first one I will ask the panel uh, is a question from uh, Jacinta. Is there information about how perimenopause and menopause impact cognitive health? Can I take that one? Um, I mentioned earlier in our in our talk about um, an online uh, document that's available as a PDF from the International Menopause Society about the connection between menopause and brain fog. So it has a, a really good explanation about what women need to be aware of, as well as um, some of the lifestyle modifications and changes that they can make to mitigate some of those uh, concerns that they have. Uh, it's the International Menopause Society. Uh, it's called Advice for Women, and it's a six or seven page PDF file that you can download for free online. Great, thank you. Um, this question is specific to you, Angelita, from Denise. Um, they're wondering, what were some of the signs that you missed for your mom that you would like to share? 
Okay. So um, I think one of the things that we missed would be what we dismissed as fatigue. Um, we also overlooked her repeating the stories and we dismissed that as fatigue. So I'd have a phone call with her and, and then she'd tell me the same story. And then a few minutes later, she's repeating the same story. I also, um, her getting lost, her, her spatial, you know, in terms of she had a, a minor fender bump, bumper and we didn't realize that that was one of the symptoms as well. Um, her uh, just withdrawing, we would have family functions and she would pull away and she would be quiet. Her lack of response to certain situations as well. Like normally my mom, she was in her fullness of life. She was a very bubbly person and just her becoming very quiet and reserved. Again, I think we dismissed that as fatigue because she's worked so hard. So um, along with her change in personality, things that she normally would wear, she started to not wear those things anymore. So she presented differently. So I think just to summarize, she started, her behavior changed, her presentation and her engagement changed. Those three things I think would be mainly what we noticed but dismissed as fatigue at the initial stage or onset. Thank you so much for sharing that experience. Um, I think your perspective is really, really valuable. Um, so thank you so much for, for just sharing everything that you have um, throughout this, this panel. Um, the next question, uh, I think we can direct to Lynn because it is um, related to the six pillars of health that you had mentioned. Uh, the question is from Natasha and they're wondering if you find, um, if you, I'm so sorry. <laughs> They're essentially just wondering um, that when you're sort of working on, on forming new neural pathways or making like new connections in your brain by just learning new things, mm -hmm. um, whether you're still doing a good enough job if you learn something that you have uh, a passion for. Um, yeah. And that, you know, like isn't necessarily harming the brain in any way. I think it's all about new learning. It can be small things. So if you're right-handed, brush your teeth with your left hand, I drive a different way to work. The more complex though, the better. So learning a new language, learning to tango dance, these are all good things that really help develop your brain. But if you're gonna do new things um, in the areas that you enjoy, like if you like to hike, go on different trails, like it's easier to stick with things if you like them. And if you do them with other people, it's also easier, but it, it is all about, uh, new learning and the complexity of that new learning, that's going to give you the best benefit. But even small things help. Lots of lots of small steps help. Thank you so much. Um, I, there are a couple of other questions in our Q&A box, but I think unfortunately that is um, all the time we had for this specific segment of the panel. Um, again, any unanswered questions, uh, that we weren't able to get to today will be responded to um, by email if you provide your contact information. So um, I just, again, really wanna thank you all so much for your thoughtful questions and the invigorating discussion. Um, thank you to the amazing panelists and the viewers for your participation in today's talk. Uh, join us next time on April 16th for a talk about indigenous peoples and dementia. And you can find more details now um, through the link that is being shared in the chat about that next webinar. The recording of the session will be posted on the Alzheimer's Society of Canada's YouTube channel in the coming days. So please do keep an eye out for notification from the society when it's posted. News about Dementia Talks Canada is also featured in Brain Canada's monthly newsletter, Brain News. And we invite you to stay up to date by subscribing to the Brain News mailing list through the link in the chat. Any feedback about the event or questions can be sent to publications at alzheimers.ca. And really thank you all so much again to the panelists um, just for your, your thoughts and your inputs and your expertise and to um, all of the viewers uh, tuning in from wherever you are uh, across, across Canada and, and hopefully internationally as well. 
Um, just thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to learn about this really important topic um, and contributing to, to this much needed conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.